Good morning. I'm t thank you for coming. I'm really excited to see such a wonderful crowd here today. I'm Tamara Kinzer Ursum. I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate and Professional Programs here in the College of Engineering. I'm also the Marta E. Gross Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering and the proud co-founder of OmniViz Incorporated, which is a Purdue startup and a diagnostics company taking the power of the lab and putting it into the palm of your hand. But today, I'm putting on my College of Engineering hat, and I'm very happy to introduce Bruce Schechter, uh, who is our distinguished speaker today. So Bruce currently resides in Palo Alto, California. He's an active advisor, consultant, and investor in a variety of technology startups, including Life360, Big ML, Carbon Lighthouse, Illumio, and Three Point Data. Bruce began his career at Intel Corporation in 1980, and has served, uh, and served there a 17-year th tenure in a variety of roles, including fab process engineering, microprocessor product management, the corporate strategy group, and the director of online marketing. Bruce was on the founding team of Pandesic LLC, a pioneering e-commerce cloud service provider, where he served as director of operations, uh, director of operations management, and later director of strategic alliances. Bruce's connections to Purdue run deep. He received his Bachelor's of Science degree in physics and math, uh, where he graduated with the highest honors and Phi Beta Kappa. Later, as he was building his career in Silicon Valley, he received a master's degree in computer science from Stanford University. Bruce is active in mentoring students, uh, student entrepreneurs, at both Stanford and Purdue and is active in nonprofit work, including his role as founder and president emeritus of the Intel Alumni Network, which is a worldwide network of former Intel employees with a focus on thought leadership. I know Bruce um, and have made it acquaint his acquaintance through his work as co-founder and co past co-chairman of the Purdue Silicon Valley Boilermaker Innovation Group, otherwise known as, as SV Big. This group is an a set of, of fantastic people, esteemed Purdue alums, that offer mentoring to Purdue startups um, in the Silicon Valley, or Purdue startups really worldwide. So the College of Engineering is very excited to have such a distinguished thought leader with us today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Bruce Schechter. Now, sounds, sounds good. Well, that was quite an introduction. Let's see if I can, let's see if I can live up to everything Tamara said. Um, first, I, I just want to start by saying, uh, I'm just another guy like the rest of you. That's, that, you might notice, the one in the middle, that's me. That was in 1980 when I graduated with my degree in math and physics and had, I had, you know, I thought I knew what my career would be, but what I ended up doing was just had nothing to do. This is like what I say to every student who will listen to me is like, don't fret too much about all these big decisions you're making because life has a way of just offering you opportunities over and over and you'll fall along the way and you'll get back up and things will happen. So anyway, that, that was me. Uh, but here today, I'm here because I'm guessing many or most of you have aspirations of being an entrepreneur. Um, <clears throat> let's just do a little experiment. Like, who all in the room, in any way, shape, or form, either aspires to be an entrepreneur or is already working on something? Now, no surprise you wouldn't be here, so that's basically everybody. What about who all is actually in some way working on something, like you're building a product or, oh, that's awesome. And finally, who all, if any, have actually gone out and tried to generate capital or funding for your startup? Okay, good. Well, fantastic. You'll be the experts. I'll be calling on you along the way to help me for things I don't understand. Um, before I dive in, I, I've got a bunch of caveats. Like, first of all, I'm going to be talking largely about how you prepare to go out in the real world and talk to the likes of angel investors or, or venture capital firms. But in fact, those are not the best funding sources. Best funding sources, hands down, or what I, we, at least we in Silicon Valley broadly define as bootstrapping. Bootstrapping means, first and foremost, it's great if you can 
get a customer to pay you money for a product. Because later, when you talk to investors, they're going to be very impressed that you're already generating money. So, but, but this can come in any forms. And here, I, what I see is here at Purdue, oh, I'm not used to be able to, not being able to point at my screen. Here we go. Like NRE, like non-recurring engineering, like, meaning like some company is so excited about what you're doing, you generate excitement with them that they might pay you like blocks of money as some kind of pre-purchase of something that's coming down the road. Or government grants, this is another thing, exceptionally good resources here at Purdue for generating uh, government grants. So these are the ideal funding sources. But, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I am here to talk about preparing to talk to the traditional investors. Now, someday, as an entrepreneur, you'll probably walk into a room, maybe for the first time in your life that looks something like this, where some investors are going to walk in behind you and sit down in front of you. And it's a daunting experience because I, I call it like, it's the, my analogy to asymmetric warfare. It's like they know all the rules. They've done this 500 times before. You've never done it. You're not sure of the lingo, blah, blah, blah. And my goal here today, to, to any extent I can, I'm hoping to try to kind of fill in some of the blanks for you on what you should know to be better prepared to face them. Um, and I, I, more, I, I, more caveats I want to make. I've never met a venture capital firm outside of Silicon Valley, so I, I don't know the lay of the land here in the Midwest. But I can't imagine it's all that much different. Um, and I will also say every entrepreneur is different and every venture firm and every investor is different. So I'm going to tell you about what I think are some great kind of rules of thumb. But there, there's no magic. I mean, your, your experience may be very different. And in fact, to the extent we have time, those of you who said you've talked to investors, feel free to raise your hand and argue with me along the way. You know, that, I think that'd be great fun. You know, like, Let's talk about different experiences. So um, I'm a big believer that every presentation has to have one big thing. So let's talk about my one big thing is investors don't fund products, they fund companies. Um, you know, I, I, I talked to, some, I forget who it was earlier this week here on campus, somebody was telling me that they watch Shark Tank, which I've never, basically never watched. Apparently, they say this all the time on Shark Tank, so I'm not the first person to come up with it. But the, I, well, let me let me explain what I mean by investors fund pro, don't fund products; they fund companies. So imagine this: some mythical scenario here. Here's here's a wonderful tech startup CEO, the woman on the left. She's here bragging about her amazing product and all the amazing technology they've invented to underlie it. And these are really important things, and they should be very proud of them. But what do you think the, in this case, they're all guys, the guys on the right, what do you think they're thinking? Well, because I'm in such a hurry, I'm going to tell you the answer. <laughs> but they, they're interested in products, but they're thinking much bigger view of this company. Like, things like, they're trying to do a lot of mental math on how would I judge, like, what kind of of total profit margin over the years can this company generate? Uh, do they have a sales strategy? Like, do they, like, like are, they, are they just trying to believe that if we build a better mousetrap, mouse trap, people will come and hand them millions of dollars? Well, in fact, everybody knows every startup has trouble generating sales. If you, have, if you start a startup and you have some trouble with your first sales, welcome to the crowd. I mean, that's part of the game. You know? And, and we'll talk more about that as we go. Team building, I mean, I could list 10 other items here on the right, but there's a lot that they're looking for. And this, this, this is the theme of my talk, to be thinking about primarily all those things on the right. I mean, you're, you're here at Purdue, you're, you're gonna learn about great products and great, great technology here, I, I can't add to that. But I can add a little bit to the things on the right there. Now, more, I'm gonna talk a couple more thoughts about the, like helping you try to think about the mindset of investors. Well, at least, at least in Silicon Valley, we tend, to cater, we tend to oversimplify the world into two categories. First, the ideal Silicon Valley company is what we call venture scale startups, meaning they have, they're usually tech companies. They tend to have something about them that once they get the engine going, they can grow hyper fast and get very big, you know, faster than like a, you know, 
Kleenex company would be or something like that. You know, and, and we compare these to, it's, it's a little bit of a derogatory firm, but, a term, but we call everything else lifestyle businesses. And, and what we mean by that is like, you look across the United States, I don't have any stats, so I'm making up stats, so, so v let the buyer beware, I'm making all this up, but like, I would say like 99% of businesses in America are what I would call a lifestyle business. They can be really successful. The founders may become very wealthy. They may have many employees. They may live, live on for 100 years, whatever. But they grew at a rate that was not fast enough to make the venture capital type of investors ever have an interest. So they're going to have to take loans from banks and things like that. It, 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 it's a wonderful business, but it's just completely different than anything I know about. So it's kind of like, if you're interested in that, you know, I'm sorry you came to the wrong talk, but, but I don't think that's you. Um, and uh, let's see. So one more thought along those lines. Venture companies often talk in terms of a power law distribution. Now, you're all, you're all math nerds in here like me, so you, you can relate to this. You know, it's like we're, like imagine you're ranking size of something. Let's say it's like size of cities across America. And if you rank them, uh, you'll find that they tend to fall statistically along something along the lines of the rank varies in inverse proportion to some power of, I'm sorry, the size of the city distribution varies in inverse proportion to some power of its ranking. But most importantly, it turns out this is true for companies. And it's true for companies within a market segment. Like, you know, pick, pick your market segment and go look it up. You'll probably be amazed. Like Google, <clears throat> Google, like 85% market share in search. Bing, 9% market share. Yahoo, 3%. And then beyond that, nobody's even heard of any other company there. Now, it took years for this to settle out. It didn't start that way 25 years ago. But as it settles out, some company's going to dominate. Well, if you're an investor, you know, it doesn't take, doesn't take a rocket scientist like Neil Armstrong to think about um, what are they looking for? They're, they're looking for that one on the end. They, you know, they'll, they'll settle if they get top one, maybe top two, maybe even top three. But anything below that, for them, it's a loss. Now, so, so what... <laughs> So what you're looking, now imagine, you're in talking to these investors, your job is to convince them in some way that you think you can, you can grab that share over there. You know, often these are called category killers. You know, investors love category killers. Some, there's new, you know, technology is constantly disrupting. New entrants are being created, but somebody's gonna dominate the category. Your job is to, number one, do dominate the category, but number two, convince your investors early on that that's, that's the game you're in. Okay, so um, one more thing about knowing your audience. I this, this is utterly fascinating. I hope you find it as fascinating as me. I've, I've recently interviewed friends in venture capital firms because I wanted to see if what I'm saying here is reasonably correct. These are orders of magnitude what I'm gonna talk about. But like, this is like, how does a VC spend his time across, let's say, one year? So a typical VC might see a thousand different companies coming, coming seeking investment. Now, most of the time, vast majority of these came in on email or some form of something like email. Excuse me. And this, this man or woman at the VC firm never even saw the company. Like, they'll knock out, uh, let's see, like 85% of them, according to my stats here. They'll take 150 first meetings. So 15% of those that came their way. So, Right off the bat, you're thinking, you've got to be very crisp and clear when the first communication goes to that investor, because you don't want to be the 85%. You're going to have to be the, uh, the winner. So let's, let me try to pick up the pace here. So out of those, now we're down to only 10% of those get a second meeting. And then it gets more complicated from there, because if, if you're at the second meeting, you're pretty ser really seriously in the game, but there's a lot of activity that will follow. And so finally, in the end, that investor only does two investments in a year. And I, you know, I, I used to think, wow, that's, that's crazy. I don't, what do they do all day? Well, think about it. What happens is if you're the guy from an, in, man or woman, by the way, from the venture firm, and you, when you make an investment, if you're the person that brought the deal into your investment firm, you're probably gonna take a, board, a seat on the board of directors of that company. And that's a huge commitment. And it's gonna last for years. We always say it's, 
It's like a marriage. You, that person on the board is going to be with that company for years to come to get them grown up and try, try to get them big. So big commitment. But the point is, imagine this. A thousand came in and two yielded. So part of, part of pitching investors is be prepared for a lot of no's. I don't know any company that didn't get a lot of no's. But it's very, much, it's very much like what I love to say about sales. If you're getting a lot of no's, your job is to not view those as bad. You're going to view those as learning experience. Every no, you're learning. Because what is a startup? A startup is a problem-solving entity. You look for problems and you solve them. When somebody says no to you, you try to figure out why did they say no. And then I'm, I, it's easy for me to oversimplify this, but it's like you rank all those issues you know of, and you figure out which ones can we fix so that it might get us over the next hump to move on to the next stage. Okay, so think of this as a funnel. You know, your job is to figure out, optimize all of your preparation for the introduction to these companies and your meetings with these companies so that you pierce your way down through that funnel and come up the bottom of the funnel. And finally, on my setup, uh, I would say, I love this analogy that supposedly famously, you know, first of all, Michelangelo often thought of as the greatest sculptor that ever lived. And someone uh, supposedly asked him, how in the world do you take this big block of granite and create this amazing sculpture? And he said, well, you know, it's easy. I saw this angel in the marble and all I did was carve to set him free. And now you're thinking, what does this have to do with talking to a VC for him? Well, I think it's the same, like you, if you're an entrepreneur, and those of you who already are kind of know this, you start to gather all kinds of information about your market and your product and your company and all the issues involved in your company. But when you go in and talk to an investor, you have a really short amount of time. And you have got to carve that granite out of the way and figure out in your limited communication with these investors, where's the powerful story in there? And the biggest mistake we all make, all of us, is we talk too much. And I like to say, you know, like you say things that don't need to be said, you're often just throwing red meat to an angry dog. You know, it's like, it, it give them more things to argue about, you know. So, and I'm not, saying, I'm not saying lie or give misinformation, but just pick the information that's the winning story. Um, let's see, how am I doing? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, now, moving right along. Uh, one, other, one other thought about your mentality about speaking to these investors is that when you prepare, it's not about you, it's about them. Your whole mentality should not be, what do I want to tell them? It's more like, what do they want to hear? And, and the rest of my talk is trying to do my best to kind of feed you, what do I think is on their mind? Like, you, you just have to be so careful that you think about what are the things these people are looking for and you feed them that. And it, it's not a natural act. You know, you have to learn. And, and it's iterative too, back to my earlier point. Like you, you go into these meetings, like typically you, you will, early on you need to decide who's the CEO of this company. That will be the spokesperson forever to investors because they're the one that represents you in the board of directors meetings. And that person should bring along a key lieutenant that's also in the room and watching every move during the meeting. Like, where did, the, where did they go from smiling to frowning during the meeting? You know, because that might clue you in on something that didn't convince them. And also, I have to warn you, beware. The investors love what I would call happy talk. Like, they'll tell you, oh, this is so great. I love, I love that you're doing this. Um, you're a little early for me, so let's keep in touch. And... And first of all, that may just be simply true because a lot of you know, companies have size targets and they won't invest earlier. But if they really believe in you, no matter what size you are, they can invest. Your, your job is to discern what could we have said that day. And, and the thing you never do, the sign of, to me of a not mature entrepreneur is they come out of the meeting and they look at each other and they say, geez, those guys, they just don't understand what kind of idiots are they that they didn't understand what we're selling, telling them? Because if they don't understand what you're saying, who do I think made the mistake? I, I, don't, I don't, you know, they may be idiots, by the way, but still, it, I don't care if they're idiots, we want their money, you know? <laughs> but it's our job 
to explain things simply and clearly to, to get through. Now, let's talk a typical introduction, like the, the engagement of a relationship with an entrepreneur, it, it goes through a sequence. You know, at some point, there's some early introduction. Sometimes you're lucky, you're in some kind of a conference and they are there and you grab them in the hallway and you give them your elevator pitch and they express an interest and then this may, might kick off a conversation via email, something like that. But most of the time, an intro is simply somebody in your valued network introduces you to them. Okay, and then, then you, oops, I'm sorry, I have to, oh, I, oh I've, I, my, I can't stand to mess up my build slides. Um, so usually that, that's going to follow up with you're going to send a little further. They're going to say something like, send me more information. So you send something before they're likely to take a, a first meeting. Then they take a first meeting. Now you're really, now you're starting to be in the game. And, and at least for the dis purpose of this discussion, that's as far as I'm trying to prepare you. Now I'm going to talk about all the things I think you should prepare to go through that sequence. Well, you, know, you all know the classic elevator pitch concept. You know, I can't emphasize enough how you obsess about this. You want to have a, the equivalent of a strong paragraph, and you rethink it over and over. You test it on every human being you ever pass because it's got to be strong and powerful and convincing, but not too technical because you don't want... You can't trust that people on the, that you're talking to even comprehend what you're talking about. So this is a really difficult challenge, but you're trying to get a crisp, simple story that gets you to, for them to say, I want more information. Then I would, uh, I wonder if I can point with, nah, I can't point on here. Um, then I call it an executive summary, and I'll show you in a minute an example, but like a one-pager you send ahead that gives much more information than, like, a, like an elevator pitch to me is like a 30 to 60 seconds of, of information consumption. An executive summary, even though it's only one page, gives somebody something to think about for like 20 minutes, a lot of, a lot of thought. Finally, you get in the room and you're gonna bring a PowerPoint deck or, or whatever tool you use, Google Sheets or whatever. And you, now you can really delve into quite a bit of detail and, and we're gonna talk about all of that as we go. So, um, first let's talk about the elevator pitch. Um, Oh, oh, good, I didn't remember if I got this quote in here. Many of you may know about Y Combinator, you know, it's like the, the premier accelerator program in, in Silicon Valley. And, and like, you look at the power law, Y Combinator is the one in rankings of all incubators in the world, it's the one that dominates. Like, so many great companies came out of there. Anyway, Paul Graham's one of the founders. I'm gonna read what he said. Writing about something, even something you know well, usually shows you don't know it well as you thought. Putting ideas into text is a severe test. The first words you choose are usually wrong. You have to rewrite the sentences over and over and get them exactly right. So these, whether it be your elevator pitch or your executive summary, please don't think it's like a homework assignment where you write, the, you know, you write your essay once and you're done. These will evolve sometimes for years because if you're a wildly successful uh, entrepreneur, you're gonna go through multiple waves of fundraising. And the story has to get better and better as you go, and you're gonna rethink these things over and over. And, and every time you leave a failed investor meeting, you rethink these things. So don't underestimate them. Um, now I'm gonna give you an example. This is completely made up, but it, it, it makes a point. I'm, I, I, this is, imagine me, I have a friend at a venture firm, and I've offered to introduce an entrepreneur to that, that gentleman. So I'm just going to read you the key element here. I wanted to bring to your attention a company called Flex Tech Sciences, which soon starts human trials on a device promising to cut the cost of knee replacement surgery by 60% and increase resulting ambulatory responsiveness by 30%. At an ASP of $5,000 and 800,000 knee replacement surgeries per year in the U.S., this offers an available market of $4 billion in the U.S. alone. They have several medical supply distribution partners already prepared to ink deals, and their CEO previously ran sales at Medtronic, and their CTO is a UPenn grad. Now, the fact is, this is a pretty short message, but there could be a huge amount of thought went into this. Uh, for example, you do notice I didn't talk about how many megahertz per millicycle or titanium per, you know, I mean, 
I didn't talk tech. I talked about business fundamentals. You know, what real difference in a business this can make. Um, I talked about like what I will be talking later about go-to-market strategy. They know, they know how to go out and find customers for this product. I also did probably some conniving things like I, I might have said that the CEO ran sales at Medtronic because I happen to know that that investor used to work at Medtronic and they would love that. So, or it's like you guys, everybody should refer to, like if some investor has some relationship to Purdue University, you're gonna brag about that. These are the games we play. And same, same for the UPenn thing. I, I probably only mentioned the UPenn thing because I know there's some affiliation with UPenn. Okay, so that's an elevator pitch. Now let's, uh, let's go on to the executive summary. Um, I want to, I want to, uh, oh, well, hold off on that. Let's see. So, so I've talked about being concise and clear. I, I think, I love this quote from Pascal, who supposedly, he was in a, I don't know what the context was, but he was writing letters back and forth with another scientific, uh, you know, scientist in his day. And I'm sure these were very complex discussions they were having via mail. But he, at the end of one of his letters, he said, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. And this is so dem demonstrative of your challenge of talking to investors, because they have very little time. And it's really easy for them to lose their attention span if they're reading something you've sent them. So an executive summary, it's all about power in short amount of time, you know, powerful impact. And you know, we, we scientists and engineers don't always have these communication skills, so newsflash, you know, like this is really important. And, and, and uh, I, I'll tell you, when I was a student here, I thought it was the sissiest, silliest thing to take a communication class, but now I know I, that was not wise uh, on my part. So, okay, this is what I think of as an executive summary. This is literally a template that I, when I coach entrepreneurs, I offer this template and work with them on filling this whole thing out. These are the basic things. I'm gonna go rapid fire through all of these bullet points here. But to me, these are the key elements. Oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, I am going to, uh, it'll take me a couple of days. I'm gonna give you a URL at the end where I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a bunch of resources of things I mentioned or things I haven't mentioned here. So I'll give you the URL. It'll take me a couple of days to like, get the slides up, but a lot of this is going to be there. So if, you know, if you're busy taking notes, you don't necessarily have to write everything down. Um, I, I, I want, so I like to do this on a single sheet of paper. And I have to, I'm going to admit to you, a lot of people in the industry kind of think of that as old school, and that's a debate we could all have. A lot of people do this in a very simple PowerPoint deck. That's perfectly fine, too. I just like, I, it's like the Y Combinator founder said, you know, put it in words. Like this, you, you, because it's like, you know, you get caught on the street someday with some opportunity to explain your company to somebody important. You want, you, this should just be like gospel memorized to you, like to be able to describe all this. So that's why I like it in text. Okay, let's, uh, let's jump in. I'm going to go through all of these bullets one by one. We don't have time to do it in great detail, but I'm gonna say a few words about each of these. So, problem solution. Please, everybody needs to talk about a problem out there. There's no, there's no product that I know of that's interesting to talk about without explaining what problem did you see out in the real world that needed a solution. So always, unless you, I mean, yeah, I highly recommend this. And, and make it really clear what this pain is. There's an old saying, let's see, do I refer to it here? Yeah, must have versus like to have. There, there's, a, there's a lingo in the VC community. It's like people, like VCs love to have painkillers instead of vitamins. And, and that means like painkillers, when people need them, they are gonna get them. You have to have them. Vitamins, you know, eh, I forgot to take my vitamin, big deal, you know. So, so be very clear about the pain. <coughs> and next on my list, market opportunity. Um, I, it's basically, they, like they, when you walk in that room, by the way, this is, I guess, more often than not Zoom calls now. I'm still getting used, used to the new world that started, you know, three to four years ago. Uh, same animal, but uh, 
Anyway, I'll talk about the room, even though it might be a virtual room. When you walk in there, a big thing that's, whether you prime, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it's been a long week. When you walk in there, whether you prime them with data on this topic or not, they're, they're, these people are really good at mental math around numbers, particularly market share and how it relates to financials. So either you give them your assumptions or they're gonna make up their own assumptions. And I'll guarantee you that your assumptions look way more favorable than their assumptions. So don't let them make up the numbers. So, and, and my favorite thing is what you saw in that earlier uh, example of, the, uh, of my example elevator pitch. I love a, what I call narrative equation, where you would say, well, it was like that example. Like you say, well, I'm gonna sell cloud storage. You know, there's so many gigabytes of cloud storage needed in America, and I charge, you know, $2 per gigahertz per megawatt or whatever. And, and then you give them enough data, like two or three or four data points where there's just some simple math where they can come up with a big number. It's like, okay, if all these assumptions are realized, we're a $4 billion company. You give them that, now they, can, they, can, they can't argue with math, that's good. You know, math is pretty, pretty solid stuff. They can argue with your assumptions, and that's fine. We'd be happy to have that argument around the assumptions. But you give them an anchor point to work with. Um, okay, so uh, moving right along, uh, competition. One thing you never say is we don't have competition. It's awfully tempting for people who feel like they've invented something new. Everybody has competition. It's often very indirect. It's hard to tell. Often the competition is just like you have a technological solution and there is no other technological solution. The, the competition is the refusal of people to use technological solutions. You know? And that is, that is a serious form of competition. And also be very honest because Trust me, if you don't signal who the key competition is, they're gonna figure it out, and then you just lose credibility if you're, if you're not uh, clear about that. Oh, and another thing, finally, a lot of entrepreneurs love to explain what's amazing about their competitors, you know, but you should be explaining what's amazing about you. You focus on your advantage, not focusing on what their advantage is, that, obviously. Okay, now business model. Basically, business model to me uh, and I see so many weird interpretations of what business model is, but to me it's simply, who sells what to whom for how much money? It's like, you make money. It's, it's often so unclear to those people across the table. Like, you start talking about some ecosystem of we, we sell into this market of this and that, and we fix this problem. And then in the end, the guys on the other side of the table are thinking, I'm not even quite clear which piece of this they sell, and which is it that their partners sell. Or, and whatever, so you've got to be really dead clear. Who is the customer? Very clear, who is your customer? Who writes the check to buy your product? Okay, go to market strategy. I think of this, uh, I'm gonna go in reverse order here. I call this the, the big dog, or like, and I, I call it think big and start small, and I'm gonna go back here and explain. Like, what I mean is, go to market is how do we acquire customers? There could be some marketing, there could be some kind of social media, or if you have some real money to spend, there might be some form of advertising, there might be some telesales, there may be whatever. There, it, every business is different, so it's very hard to generalize. But keep in mind that investors are smart, and if you're an earliest stage entrepreneur, you don't have any, for all practical purposes, you have no money. You're barely surviving. Every startup company is the same way, unless you, well, I mean, there are always these grand exceptions, but. You have very little money. So don't tell the investors we're going to have advertising and direct sales. Well, that means nothing. They're looking at you and you're like, let's see, there's four of you here and you have no money. <laughs> like, how are you going to do direct sales and advertising? And I think what you probably meant was eventually we'll do that. So that's why I call it uh, start small, think big. So be very clear. Here's what we're going to doing now. You're going to write a check to me for the next year. That, uh, but you're gonna write a check to me, and that's gonna cover me for the next year. During that next year, here's what we're gonna do. And oftentimes, that means we got nothing but a network of our own that we've already built through, you know, whatever, and we've met a few people at some conferences, and we're gonna work those 
really hard. But then, then you're going to say, that's the kind of closer to more of the bootstrapping approach. Then you say, now, if we can achieve some milestone, then we're going to go big. Then we're going to hire direct sales. Is that the 10-minute warning? Great. Five. Uh-oh. Now I'm really in trouble. Okay. Anyway, you get, you get the point. Um, so now, th th I've hit all the key bullets on that, uh, on that list. And please, just test it everywhere you can. Like, make sure... E Everybody on your team understands it because any of you might happen to make that right connection at the right times. And also, your team, if you're the CEO, the team, uh, they, they, they just need to, they need to understand it. If they don't understand it, you're in, really, you're in really big trouble. We laugh, we say this all the time laughably, talk to your parents. They're a great example of, can we explain this to people who have no idea? So many VCs have said this over the years that, they prefer that entrepreneurs can, can tell this story to their mom or their dad because then they know it's been simplified in a way that anybody understands it. So, uh, yeah. Okay, you get the point. Um, now, finally, uh, PowerPoint deck. This is what, you know, when you get that big meeting, that, that executive summary got you in the door. When you get that big meeting, now is your chance to really tell the whole story. And really, everything we've already... Oh, <laughs> okay. Da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Keep, you're going to have PowerPoint slides or whatever tool you use. Keep it really simple. Minimize words. Minimize complex technolo technological uh, data. Just like make sure they just fundamentally understand what you do, how you make money, and how big you think you can be. Um, and, and then, oh, oh, the famous Guy Kawasaki rule. I don't know if any guy was this famous uh, evangelist in the early days of, of Apple, and, uh, and he later has worked for years in venture capital, and he had the 10, 20, 30 rule. 10 slides, 20 minutes, no font, any smaller than 30 points. Like, write no treatises on your slides. You're the star, you walk in there, it's what you say that matters, they want to know that you understand it. If there's a big pile of words on your slide, this happens to me all the time. Somebody's got this big pile of words on the slides, and they're talking. And I'm sitting there thinking, hmm, am I going to listen to her, or am I going to read those slides? I can't do both. A lot of you are smarter than me. You probably can, but I can't. So uh, anyway, you get the point. Now, really, I'm, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm keeping this very simple. Basically, the pitch deck tends to align exactly with everything I just said about the executive summary. All those topics. You just expand and make it a little more visual, um, visual in your PowerPoint deck. And I would, I, I love, I think style is super important. Presentation style can't be underestimated. And I love to uh, study the masters. My favorite example is just go, and I have this link in uh, the URL I'm going to give later, but uh, go find the original iPhone release that Steve Jobs did. It is the, it's kind of the classic. And it, it's a very different thing because it's a product launch, not an investor pitch. But his style, just so amazing. His slides are always simple and elegant. He's the star. He tells the stories. The, the slides just kind of keep the pace and, you know, convey some interesting uh, visual information. And now you may ask, well, how do I find these investors? Well, that's the topic for a future talk, so I can't say much today. But... It really is all about your network. I mean, this LinkedIn used to, years ago have, used to have this tool where you could visualize your own network. Unfortunately, they killed it off, which kills me. And I love this visual because you can see all of my Intel friends, all of my angel investor friends. You can see all of my Purdue friends in the different colors here. But anyway, work your network. And I mean, and by the, and and I can't emphasize enough for those of you who are still fairly young. Now is the time to build your network. Don't wait until you need the network to build the network. So I, I just can't say that enough. I, I do think that's a whole uh, topic in and of itself. So now finally, some tips and tricks. I, tricks. I, I need to go really quickly. So, uh, you know, get fantastic legal counsel. Oh, I'm going to say, I will emphasize this top one. Company and team clearly described on LinkedIn. I don't know how many times somebody says, hey, we're a startup. We want to talk to you, and, I, and what, do, what do I do first? I go look them all up on LinkedIn. And then, and then here's the losing story, is if I look them up 
And they claim there's a team of four. Only one of them is even mentioning this company on their LinkedIn profile. And they, and they don't even have like a link to their company page, whatever. Like if you're claiming you're a company and you want somebody to write a check, it better be dead clear that company is represented with the company's URL on LinkedIn and every member has their title acknowledged. Now, many of them have day jobs or they're students, whatever. That's fine. You can have two roles at once. But if you're ashamed, to, I, don't know what, I don't know what the reason would be, but if you're not putting yourselves clearly on LinkedIn, I guarantee you, anybody you're going to go to try to talk to is just like me. They're going to go look on LinkedIn. <laughs> so, okay, speech complete. And, uh, well, I was going to revisit this. We don't have time. And, uh, and finally, if you remember one thing, remember uh, investors fund companies and not products. So that, that completes my prepared remarks. Thank you. going to steal a mic. We have um, some time for some Q&A. So uh, if you have any questions, we have a mic in the back. And I've got a mic here. So we'll start over on this side. And then it's you. And then I'll come back to the Hi. Thanks for the great presentation. My name is Rodrigo. Um, I would like to ask, in the elevator pitch, uh, especially by email, is it beneficial to use uh, a brochure or visuals together with the paragraph, or are you trying to make it as small as possible just by text? Uh, you know, I think you probably just use judgment. And see, in my mind, from my experience, overwhelmingly, this is used not by you, but by somebody representing you. And they're going to feel very uncomfortable, you know, getting involved. They just want to do an introduction and get out of the way, you know? So, see, if, if it was you personally, I would do the elevator pitch in the text of the email, and I might have something else attached, like that executive summary. But part of it is also a game you're playing if you're trying to, uh, forgive the term, I don't have a better term, it's like a strip tease. You know, you want to gradually reveal information. If you reveal it all at once, there's nothing, there's nothing left to talk about when you get there. I mean, this is a big trade-off for entrepreneurs these days is, Investors will say, send me your deck. Well, if you send me your deck, when you get there, what, what, what's new to talk about? So that's where either you use, anyway, you, you get the idea. Yeah. Hey, so uh, if you have a product that's ready, the question is, is when do you start asking for money, right? So do I make the website myself or do I hire someone to do a perfect job of it? Do I try to read the terms and conditions or do I hire a lawyer? Uh, at what point should I really be starting to look for venture capital versus just doing that work on my own? Gosh, it's, it's such a, I mean, it's a great question. Everybody has the same question, but everybody's so different. It's really hard to say. It's like, it's like the right time to ask is when, you're, when you have a decent chance of getting it. And you, you probably don't know what chance you have of getting it. Um, I would kind of say generally it's never too soon to go talk to an investor. What I would highly encourage is if you can get an intro, tell, them, tell that investor, I'm not looking for your money. I'm looking for your advice. This, I think, is the most brilliant thing you can do because... They're going to decide when they're going to write a check. It's not when you tell them to write the check. It's when they want to write the check. If you go in and say, I want advice, you're, you're give, giving them a compliment. Oh, you're so smart. You know, I'd love your advice. And maybe you get lucky. And if not, they'll tell I mean, if you don't get lucky now, which, you, you know, on average you won't, now you've got a relationship. And, you, and, you know, and, oh, by the way, this is something I didn't talk about. Some of the best advice I can give you is you start a mailing list, an email mailing list. And, and it would be, have a distribution maybe every quarter, like every three months. You, you gather every investor you talk to, whether they say yes or no, and most say no, you put them on that list. Every, every advisor that you're trying to recruit to be an advisor of your company, every professor that expressed an interest, I mean, anybody interesting. And you use these to, number one, you distribute good news. Hey, this customer expressed some interest. We won this customer. We hired this woman that has this expertise. But the other half of the email is, here's all the things we need. We're hiring such and such, or we're looking for introductions to IBM, or whatever. And I've seen this, and I've seen it at Purdue also. Like, like it, startups are good at this, 
And they, they tell these stories, the things they got out of these mailings. And, and if they had not done that mailing, these things wouldn't have happened. And how hard it is, how hard, anyway, so there's my story. Hello. I have a question. Um, what is the best way, in your experience, to leverage non-diluted capital, like an SBR or STTR, into actually raising funds? Well, first of all, I'm not an expert on this topic, except it's, it's, it's kind of a, how would I say it? I, to me, there's not a best way. It's just that if you can get non-diluted funding, odds are there's no argument against it. I mean, every investor is going to say, we love that non-dilutive funding that came in earlier. So take it where you can get it. I mean, I gather, I've heard from some companies here that they, they often have some handcuffs with them where like you can't spend, you have to spend that money on like technology development. You can't spend it on customer acquisition. And that can be hard, but you can deal with that. And it's just a good thing. That's all I have to say. <laughs> So yeah, my question is, how do you protect your IP while in develop? Sorry, I'm over here. How do, you <laughs> how do you protect your IP while you're in development? So while you're kind of like sharing your idea with other people, but not trying to give away too much to kind of, I don't know, not put yourself fully out there? Yeah, this is another one. I, you have to forgive me. I, I don't consider myself an expert. And, and here at Purdue, they love the topic of IP. In my world, it's just often not that big a deal. This, the world moves so fast. The world moves so fast that what the investors care about is just traction and progress. And, I, but if you're highly, highly technical, if you're doing some research, yeah, how do you do that? Well, I have people sign NDAs, I guess. I, I, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty common that you could have some IP I mean, you can go all the way through and present to investors, and you, you can tell them. They hate NDAs, by the way. Everybody hates NDAs. Nobody wants to sign an NDA. Because if, if I'm on the side of the signer, all you've done is create a liability for me. Now I have to worry you're going to come back and sue me later because you're going to claim I told somebody about what you're doing. So, I mean, this is all what I learned in corporate America. Never sign an NDA if you can possibly avoid it. <laughs> so, but, but, I'm sorry. But... VCs will sign an NDA if you've got them really convinced that you got something really big. So that would be the steps I'd go through. And, and customers, hopefully you don't have to keep this. It, I, it just all depends, I, I think, on your situation. Hi, in the initial part, we had discussed bootstrapping versus going to a VC or an angel investor. So uh, in the bootstrapping phase, uh, do you think is there an absolute minimum revenue that VCs will look into um, or any thresholds like no, that? No, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Someday I'm going to have to find a way to like quantify all this because everything is different. Just it, it, like when... It, I mean, I've been on the side of the table. I, I, I haven't done a lot of investments, but when I have, I've had to think really hard. And everything's different. You're, it's, a, it's kind of a package deal. You know, it's like, you love to see some revenue, but that may not be the big thing. You love to see unbelievably talented founders that are incredible communicators. And all of these are all separate, like it's a multi-dimensional space that your, your grading curve <laughs> exists in, you know? And so, Revenue's great. Lots of times people don't have re revenue. I mean, like, like, there's probably a bunch of biomedical device people in the room. Biomedical devices, there's no way you're going to have revenue because you have to go through these FDA approval processes. So you're going to have to raise a bunch of money before there's any hope of revenue. So it's, they're, they're all different. All right. Thank you very much. Let's give Bruce another round of applause. Thank you. Do we have a, a couple of minutes to take the podium down? Okay, great. So we're just going to kind of rearrange the stage a little bit. Well, next up, we have a panel discussion. Um, and we have um, 
two student co-founders who are going to be coming on stage. We'll do introductions uh, kind of once we get set up here. But it is my pleasure. I'm going to go ahead and introduce and welcome the panel mod moderator, Chari Savran, who is a professor of mechanical engineering and the director of the John Martinson Entrepreneurial Center here at Purdue. Um, and uh, Chari is also a co-founder. And maybe he can say uh, why we're getting, uh, getting switched around here. You can tell us a little bit about, about your just right. hype your startup. All right. Uh, thank you very much for coming here. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's lunchtime, and uh, hopefully uh, we were able to uh, <laughs> provide a little bit of uh, something for you. Um, so, uh, Chari Savran, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. Uh, I, am the, uh, uh, I was an undergraduate, Purdue undergraduate myself. I was here in 94 and 98. Um, and uh, as uh, Professor Kinzer Ersam pointed out, I'm uh, the director of the uh, John Martinson Entrepreneurial Center. What we are wanting to do is to have every single one of you start your own company. Okay, that's our goal. Okay, so uh, as uh, she mentioned, I'm also a, a startup founder. Uh, name of my company is Sovereign Technologies, and uh, our goal is to revolutionize non-invasive diagnostics, especially in the fields of women's health conditions. Okay, so uh, with that, we would like to uh, get started on our panel. So we have uh, you know, Bruce Schechter, who doesn't need uh, any introduction. We have uh, Professor Kinzer Ersam, uh, who uh, doesn't need any introduction, but I'm still going to ask her to, 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 to talk about her, her company. So in addition to Bruce Schechter, we have three founders here, founders of uh, Purdue companies. We have Nick Gnetti, right, of Aerovi. We have uh, Jay Shah uh, from Nurava, and we have Professor Kinzer Ersam from uh, Omnivis, OK? So um, uh, what uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, three questions, OK? Uh, but before asking the questions, I'm going to ask uh, each uh, uh, founder to talk very briefly about their companies. Uh, and, uh, 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 and then we're going to get to the questions. So um, the, 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 um, the, the goal of this panel, uh, again, is not to have just a general discussion, OK? We have an agenda, OK? Our agenda is to. Uh, convince you uh, that instead of uh, looking for a job, you should be starting your companies. That is our goal, okay? That's our hidden agenda in the back of our minds, which I just revealed to you. That's why we're having this panel, okay? So even though I'm gonna be asking some very specific questions, uh, I'm gonna ask the, uh, the, the, the panelists to uh, uh, answer them in any way they want. If there's some anecdotes that come to your mind and if you feel you need to go off a tangent uh, to, uh, to, to, to address something else that, is, that you feel is more important, please go ahead and do that, okay? So uh, uh, let me first uh, 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 go around the, uh, the, the, the podium here and uh, have uh, each founder talk about their companies a little bit. Please, Professor Kinzer. All right. Thank you, Chari. Um, so my startup company um, is Omniviz Incorporated. We're a diagnostics company. Uh, and our tagline is putting the, the power of the lab in the palm of your hand. Um, this is founded on a technology that was developed uh, by myself and Steve Worley and graduate student at the time. Katie Clayton. Um, it was a particle diffusometry technology. We found it was very sensitive in um, detecting pathogens uh, in, um, in different infected samples, whether it be you know, body fluids or infected water. Uh, the CEO and other co-founder is Katie Clayton. Uh, we also have Jackie Linus, who's a professor in biomedical engineering here as well. Katie runs the company day to day, has been doing so for about five years now full time. Um, and it's been a, just an absolutely wonderful experience to support her and watch her growth and, and grow the company. Um, we've had over $3 million of non-dilutive funding uh, and currently raising our first Series A uh, capital, uh, venture capital at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to skip uh, uh, Bruce here, who uh, enlightened us a great deal, So uh, and, uh, and go to Jay. Jay, please tell us a little bit about yourself and the company. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am a Purdue grad. I did my PhD here at Purdue in electrical engineering. Um, I worked in a medical devices lab out uh, in the BME building. Um, and from there, we started uh, Narava. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of a medical device startup called Narava. We are developing wearable devices for epilepsy patients. Um, where our wearables are looking to not only do seizure detection, but also being able to monitor something called SUDEP, 
or sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. So these patients can suddenly die normally healthy, suddenly die in their sleep. So we're creating wearables that can help track that, detect it, send alerts out to, to uh, mitigate the risk of that in these patients. Um, so yeah, looking forward to being on the panel today. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jay. And Nick, please. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Gennady, founder and CEO of uh, Arovi. We're based right out over on Northwestern in uh, Wang Hall. I'm a three-time Purdue student, so I did my undergrad here, uh, ended up going to master's, and then was pursuing my PhD in AAE. Um, so I really drank the Kool-Aid. But uh, it's great to be uh, back here at Purdue. Uh, Arovi is a uh, cloud-based energy management and planning uh, company that works on electric aviation. So our main customer are airports, vertiports of the future for mobility. Um, we just raised our first pre-seed round of just around a million dollars, and uh, we're scaling quickly. So um, yeah, so deploying for the next uh, three Olympics, working with a, a lot of big names, and, and uh, excited to be here. All right, uh, thank you very much for those uh, introductions. Uh, so uh, now I'm gonna go to my first question, okay? So uh, the first question is, what is it that made you start a company, like at the personal level? Uh, you or your co-founders, uh, whose idea was it, and uh, why in the world did you want to start a company? Okay, let me start with Professor Kinzerza. Um I'm going to, uh, yeah, there was multiple reasons. So I actually worked at a startup company um, after my postdoc, uh, so I kind of caught the bug there. Um, I was the fifth hire in the startup company and just loved the, the very dynamic environment there and loved the, what we were able to do. Um, but I couldn't resist when Purdue came calling. So uh, I am now a career professor. But um, the, the impetus for, for Omni, founding Omniviz was really Katie Clayton's vision. Um, she knew that she wanted to be an entrepreneur. She knew she wanted to be in, in global health. She wanted to make a difference in the world. Um, and I wanted to help her and, um, and be a part of that journey. Um, so it was very kind of, from a, a personal standpoint, um, just kind of seeing where we could take this company together and um, we saw a lot of promise and she is, has boundless amounts of energy and um, I feel my role here is to support her in that. And so He really does have a boundless amount of energy, <laughs> by the way, I know her. <laughs> awesome, then uh, what do you think, um, Jay, like from your perspective, why did you guys start this company? Yeah, so I can give a little personal story as well. So, you know, growing up, um, I was always sort of interested in, in, in business as well. My grandfather had a tooth, toothbrush factory uh, in India. And then uh, my dad, you know, growing up as kids, we'd always talk about the stock market. And, or, you know, he'd always be teaching me about the stock market, supply and demand, markets, all that stuff. Um, so I always was interested in that. But I was also always interested in medicine. Uh, my other grandfather had a pacemaker. So I was always interested in medical devices. Um, and so when I came to Purdue, um, I knew I wanted to do, you know, obviously pursue my PhD, get a better understanding in developing medical technology. Uh, but I always had an interest in entrepreneurship. I joined another one of my professor startups, started getting, uh, you know, exposure to that, what it's like, what are the challenges, what are the benefits, you know, all, all that stuff. And <clears throat> one of the main areas of focus in my lab was epilepsy. And so our lab had discovered a potential mechanism of action of why the sudden death events occur in epilepsy patients. And me and my co-founder, when, when we were talking about this in our lab meetings and, and kind of this discovery was happening in our lab, we realized that, hey, there isn't a device out on the market um, for these patients that can help mitigate this risk. There was a true unmet need, a clinical unmet need um, that these patients were suffering from. So that, that led us to form the company and start the company and say, let's, let's see what we can do to help these patients. And at that point, we also then reached out to patients, their parents, their caretakers, physicians in this space, and they just continued to validate what we were talking about, what the need is, what this problem is, and how our solution can help solve this. So that's what kind of provided that extra motivation and saying, hey, this is a real problem let's go out, form a company, and try to solve this. Nick. Yeah, so I think uh, I'll take it from a different angle. So when I was an undergrad, I interned uh, at American Airlines and then eventually worked at GE Aviation. 
And uh, I think like Jay, I had some you know family entrepreneurship and grew up in the Bay Area. You're always sort of infected by the the startup bug, I would say. But I think what uh, really flipped my or changed my mind was you know being um, in these massive companies, right? Hundred thousand plus people working on like aircraft and engines. Um, they're really good at doing big things at scale, but they're actually not so good when you need to do you know small problems, the market's not big enough, so it leaves space, right? So I, I was always wondering, like, why do startups exist if these big corporations can do it themselves in, like, a week? And it's because they move slowly, there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's so much overhead. Um, and so that, I think, was the, the premise for when I went into grad school. We started working on studying operations and future limitations of uh, electric air mobility. And it was just staring us in the face that uh, energy was gonna be the biggest barrier for this whole industry. So, um, you know, we just submitted a project to the FAA competition. It was actually a, a roommate and, and I, a good friend of mine from undergrad, for uh, just for fun, we submitted a, a project to the FAA competition, and then we ended up winning the competition by accident, I would say. Um, and afterwards, the FAA pulled us aside and said, you know, this idea is actually pretty good. You should really commercialize it. Um, and that kick-started the process of, uh, you know, enriching the technology and pulling it out of Purdue IP and, and working through commercialization. So I would say, you know, if there are opportunities for class projects, um, you know, uh, federal student project activities, opportunities, uh, there are, you know, always opportunities to, to kickstart companies that way. Awesome. So, Bruce, you've seen a lot of founders. Uh, in your experience, uh, why did those people start companies instead of, you know, doing something else? Were they all different, or was there like a common ground? Uh, among, uh... Oh, sorry. Um, I I do think there's there's I don't know if it's genetics or what, but there is kind of a there's just a mentality, and so often like so often you you see these pitches from entrepreneurs, and you think I think it's a really common scenario where you're thinking, gosh, are they really going to be able to build a business around this thing? But these men and women are just, there's something there that you want to bet on. It's like, I, I have so many, this has happened here at Purdue when, when we in SV Big select, you know, companies that we're going to mentor. It'll happen very often. We'll just say, these are entrepreneurs. I, I don't know if this company's going to work, but some company they're going to do is going to work. You know? and, and then you just want to be a part of it. Um, yeah. Could I just say something unrelated? Because I'm... I'm sitting here looking around, and, and I think me being on this panel with you four amazing people is a sign of the power of the Purdue network, because I know all of these people, which is really cool. And, and, you know, and so you should never underestimate that there are alumni out there. It may not be easy to get them, but there are alumni out there that can be beneficial to what you're trying to do, and, and don't underestimate you know, the value of trying to do that. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, I, I guess it goes to uh, something that you mentioned uh, in your in your talk. Investors uh, don't invest in technologies; they invest in businesses. And a part of a business is the is the founder, right? Would you would you would you would you agree with? Oh, that? absolutely. I mean, there's an equally common catchphrase of investors don't fund companies; they fund people. You know, that's a similar but different. But absolutely. Which brings me to my uh, second question, because it's, I think uh, it's, 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 it's tied to that. Um, what are some of the most important challenges uh, that the founders face uh, in running the company? Uh, I mean, we can get really granular with this. We're not going to. We don't have that much time. But if you were to like generalize it, uh, are, are, are the biggest challenges technology related or execution related. We can lump everything non-technology related in, into uh, execution related, like fundraising and this and that, and people and all that. So, is, uh, uh, t so, so tell us a little bit about the, uh, about the, about the challenges. Yes, start on the other end. Sure, of course it depends, right? Um, but I think uh, going into it, I had always expected the technology development to be the most difficult and challenging. But you know, we're at Purdue. There's probably a subject matter expert in whatever technological tech challenge that you're trying to, to solve. Uh, what we really struggled with was uh, pure execution, right? Managing your mental health, 
you know, <laughs> you see me getting a couple reactions here. Managing um, your time, you know, it's a, it's a very emotional process, right? It's, uh, you're really uh, marrying uh, into like this company that's extremely arbitrary. I uh, wanted to echo, right, like in the, in the early days when an investor invests in you in the pre-seed or seed round, valuation is so arbitrary, there's not really much else to go off of except for the founder and, you know, picking the jockey over the horse, as people say. Uh, at later stage, right, BC plus, um, now we're looking at the pure fundamentals. So, um, I mean, that's just the perfect storm for imposter syndrome, right? Like somebody who comes up with a technology, has a cool idea, just develops, you know, signs an LLC or a C Corp uh, for a couple hundred bucks, and now you're valued at several million dollars. That's, that's terrifying. And so managing that and uh, trying to, to balance all of the moving pieces all at once and learning as you go, is um, I think was my biggest challenge and still is. Um, and uh, I guess if I were to uh, continue with uh, with the with the with a sub question, um, in order to make a company uh, survive, or even or even get it started, do you have to have figured everything out? Okay, is there such a thing? Right? Why don't you answer that? Nick? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe if you yeah, think maybe you have, then yes. something's probably wrong, right? Like you really sh you want to be developing the um, the company and the products with the customer, and I think needs change over time too. So I guess I guess is it fair to say that it's just it's just it's just important to do it, just start it, and then figure things out as you go, because uh, there are problems that are always gonna occur, right, in, in every way. There will be te te technical problems, there will be uh, people-related uh, problems, you're looking for someone or someone that's working for you, they might leave, uh, some, somebody else might, need, might, might, might knock on your door, they're very qualified, but you as a startup may not be able to hire them and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, is it fair to say that it's just uh, uh, very important to, to just keep uh, doing what you need to be doing and then uh, 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 worry about uh, problems as they occur. Has that been your experience? That's been my experience uh, as a startup founder. So I just wanted to ask if that's uh, if, if 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 you share that. If you don't, it's totally fine. I I agree with that. <clears throat> I think, you know, whether you're seasoned or a fresh entrepreneur, any new business is going to have new challenges. I think you need to go in with the mindset of, I'm willing to learn and adapt. Um, Saying I know the answer and this is the answer is not going to allow you to be successful because A, you probably don't know everything and B, things change. So having the mentality of willing, the perseverance and the mentality of willingness to learn and adapt is is very crucial. Now, you obviously don't want to be jumping to the next, the, the new shiny object every every two months, but making a conscious decision of when to pivot. You're gonna hear the word pivot a lot when you when you talk about startups and pivoting is important. You obviously don't wanna overdo it, but you don't wanna underdo it as well um, so that you can create a viable business because I don't know the answers to so many concepts and I'm running this startup right now, right? Like every day is a new, a new day where I'm learning so much more and con continuing to make progress on the business. What is your take on it? Yeah, well, I'll start with the, the first question and we can go into the into the sub question. So um, I think what you're hearing, uh, just to summarize, is that execution is actually where you find the, the most challenges. And and maybe that's because we're sitting in the College of Engineering right now. And kind of, as you mentioned, there's, there's technical expertise all the way around us. Um, and you can outsource technical expertise to, to subcontractors. But we don't train you as professors here. We don't train students to manage people. Um, that's actually, you know, kind of probably the the biggest weakness of a lot of uh, a lot of founders is they're coming from a, a technical background, but we haven't really learned how to manage people. And there's challenges and, and new learning every day on how to best to do that. How do you motivate your team? How do you keep them on track? How do you become a project manager? Um, and so, you know, that I think has been a very large learning curve for us. Um, to keep the the company moving forward, and there's and there's peaks and and valleys. Um, you know, one wrong hire can change change the whole morale of a team. Uh, we've experienced that, um, gotten through that, um, and are now come out on the other side um, better and and stronger than before. Uh, so, um, yeah, there's a lot of um, 
execution uh, in the non-dilutive funding if you're getting a grant um, or in, you know, even I can imagine from venture capital, they expect you to do something. So how do you make sure that you deliver what you've promised um, as well? And that a lot of that is just kind of project and people management. Well, uh, my uh, final question and again, we can, after that, we can open the floor for questions or we can really hear uh, from these uh, wonderful founders about uh, uh, other things that they want to say. But uh, uh, let's be a bit more Purdue specific, okay? What do you, what do you think about uh, Purdue? Well, Professor Kinzer Ursam and I are already Purdue professors, so we are obviously biased, right? We were wearing multiple hats. We're founder, company founders, but we're also professors, right? So, uh, but, uh, uh, but we have these two guys over here, right, uh, and they're... Uh, uh, they're not really uh, uh, professors or administrators at, uh, at, at, at Purdue, so I, uh, I first want to ask them, and then uh, Professor Kinzer Mercer and I, uh, and then Bruce, we can, we can, we can give you <laughs> our perspective of what makes Purdue uh, different. Uh, what are some of the advantages that we have over here? So, um, you know, we are a, tech, a tech technology school, right? So I came here to do my PhD in electrical engineering. I had no real business knowledge or how to start a company or what to think about. I just knew I was interested. So when we had formed the company, um, Purdue has this great resource. Uh, it was called the Foundry back then and now it's under another umbrella of Purdue Innovates. So when we started the company, they provide us a lot of guidance and just mentorship of, of what to do, what to think about, how to start a company. So I thought that was a fantastic resource that Purdue has invested in and, and has you know, grown and, and created a good resource for students. The, the other thing is, is as, as students, it's, you know, we're gonna go to class and that's what we are sort of paying to do, right? We're going to class, we're getting a knowledge, or, or we're trying to learn the knowledge. When you're trying to now start a business or do these other things outside of what the normal situation is of, of, of a university. As a student, you, we need to be more proactive in finding those resources. So I've heard from people, oh, we didn't know that this um, entrepreneurship center existed. We didn't know about Purdue Innovates. It's, so it's, it's finding those resources, talking to people and networking. And I thought Purdue had a great network. Um, we met Bruce, you know, several years ago and has been a great mentor for us. And we got connected to him through the Purdue Innovates, Purdue Foundry sort of network. Um, and so it's, it's being open, growing your network, which I know Bruce had talked about in, in, in his presentation, um, and finding these resources and going out and asking people for help. Um, so that's a little bit, I think the Purdue ecosystem's great. I think there's a lot of people in the network here within it in West Lafayette and then in Indiana in general, as well as um, you know, globally as well. So it's all about finding those people and using those connections to help you learn and continue to grow your business. Yeah, and I totally echo that, right? So uh, in terms of the, the startup world, I mean, uh, on the university scale, Purdue hasn't always been, uh, you know, quite far from it, the leader in developing, incubating, pushing out startups. But I think the components of the ecosystem are there, as, you know, just to echo what, what Jay is saying. So being from the Bay Area, we've been <laughs> always trying to figure out how do we move back or how do we move to the coast. Uh, but it's actually been quite difficult uh, to do so. So Purdue has become really a, a strategic partner. Uh, we're launching at the airport. There's so many resources available. Uh, there's a lot of capital available, uh, more than you would expect, um, I would say. Um, the other, you know, just to echo, the Purdue network is, is so strong, right? So a lot of the, the folks we talk to at Boeing, Embraer, uh, we're talking to like the CTO of an Embraer startup that uh, was a, a Purdue Arrow alum was a PhD student of one of the professors I worked with, right? So this connection is, is very strong. Purdue runs deep in industry. Um, I think the ecosystem partners are, are certainly there and growing. Um, and yeah, I would, I would say, you know, get involved, find the Purdue Innovates Foundry. Um, it's, it's a fantastic resource and just lean into that um, alumni connection. Bruce, what do you think? Oh, wow. Um, I think your original question was something along the lines of what makes Purdue so special? And I, I guess I feel I'm remote and I can't answer that question, but I can answer a related one is that, so our SV Big organization has been around something like 11 years now. And all I can say is things have changed a lot in 11 years. 
Because I mean, the whole foundry didn't even arise until like a year or two after we got started, and that was a big game changer. We couldn't couldn't even figure out. We figured there must be entrepreneurs on campus, but we couldn't figure out how to find them. And now there's so many resources. I, um, I, I would say we just see momentum and progress. You know, the second derivative is positive. So um, uh, I w like I, I think we did just come out of a terrible period named COVID. Things seemed to really went south everywhere. For entrepreneurship is all about connecting people and working your network. And you know, when you're stuck in a dorm room eating food alone, you know, you probably don't network very well. I don't, I don't know what it was like, but, but, but I will say, um, oh, like random thoughts. First of all, I got to say, it's amazing to me to see faculty involved in startups. Love to see it, because I mean, how you have enough time to have a life and do all this, you know, good for you. I mean, of course, same for students. You know, I, I guess you deserve as much credit as well. But, and also, I don't think we put a plug for the John Martinson Center, uh, which Chari runs. And that's, the, so we don't, I don't think we have anybody from Purdue Innovates here, but they are gearing up to have a fund. Well, they, I guess they have one, but it's getting more sophisticated. And then Chari's involved. There will be funding coming out of here. I, I don't think this is going to be widespread, but key key startups are going to start to not only get money outside but here these are things we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago so yeah it's an exciting time thank you very much well uh, that's that's absolutely right we have john martinson entrepreneurial center over here we have uh, some amazing activities some of them are geared towards uh, super early stage ideas we have a pitch competition if you haven't heard of it let me know that means we didn't do a good job disseminating that information uh, because you must have heard of it by now. Uh, we have uh, been having this pitch competition uh, for the past uh, two years now. Uh, and uh, uh, you, uh, you pitch in front of uh, judges, which includes uh, uh, Bruce Schechter uh, and uh, uh, some of his friends from SV Big. And uh, uh, everybody usually wins something. Uh, I can't guarantee that that's going to continue happening. But, uh, uh, and uh, if you win, we basically uh, write you a check. It's a personal check. You can do whatever you want with it. You don't even have to have a fully developed business idea. Okay, this is a super early stage. Our goal is we want we want to we, we want to make you start thinking about commercializing your ideas because that's a super early stage. Now at the later stage, even though that's still early stage, so early early stage and later early stage, but this is all early stage. Okay, as Bruce mentioned, we uh, have just launched a fund in which uh, through which we invest in companies. Okay, so uh, actually uh, you see two companies over here that already received a investment from the John Martinson Entrepreneurial Center. Uh, investment fund, okay, and that's an investment ma made to the company, okay. So uh, 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 I have some things to say about uh, uh, what, in my opinion, makes uh, Purdue very special. But I'd like to uh, first uh, ask Professor uh, uh, Kinzer Ursum what, uh, what 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 she thinks, please. Um, yeah, thank you, and I can't wait to hear your experiences and your ideas. But uh, I think we took advantage of almost every single resource. And I, I have a, I'm just trying to kind of run through the list in my mind. Um, we, uh, we started, um, we really built the, the first prototype in a senior design course. Um, it was a capstone project. Um, and that team, mentored by, by Katie Clayton and myself, um, went around to different pitch competitions. So um, we did the Burton Morgan pitch competition. Um, we ended up going to Rice. Uh, which has a big um, pitch competition, and then you know, and then went from there. Um, went to uh, I think Fortune 500 and, and submitted idea or Fortune magazine and submitted our ideas, um, and then started and then leveraged that to um, apply for NSF I Corps funding. Um, and there has there's a it used to be called the Firestarter program here. There's kind of a a 10 week. You know, you do 50 uh, customer interviews kind of uh, pre-NSFI uh, core. Then we leverage that into the full I-Core where you get $50,000 from, from NSF to, to do customer discovery and uh, use that to travel and talk to um, potential customers and really flush out your business ideas. You pivot uh, from what your original idea was because your original idea was uh, wrong. Uh, and then you figure out you know, what that next business model looks like. Um, then we leverage that into NSF SBIR funding. Uh, the state of Indiana pitched in $50,000 as well on top of that. Um, 
and, and then, you know, and then we, so that, you know, kind of we really took advantage of, of a lot of resources here at Purdue to, to launch the company all the way from that senior design project to, uh, to launching it out in, uh, with that first SBIR, which allowed Katie to then start working for the company full time as the CEO. Um, I'm sure I'm missing we, uh, things along the way. There was Trask funding from uh, the Office of Technology and Commercialization. Uh, we got paired with a mentor in the foundry um, that helped us kind of navigate these different spaces. Um, and I'm sure, like I said, I think, I think I'm missing uh, things on my list of resources that we took advantage of, but there's many, many um, out there. And um, there's you know, people within this Purdue network that can help get you connected with all of those resources and you just kind of use one to leverage the next and then build from there. I couldn't have done a better job describing all the resources that we have. But then from my I, want, I just want to add to that. From my perspective, what makes us uh, as Purdue uh, different is uh, the mentality that we have uh, starting all the way from the top, okay? So, and I'm going to give you, and I'm going to give you uh, re regarding entrepreneurship, mentality for entrepreneurship. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, it actually happened here in this building when uh, our current president, uh, Meng Cheng, uh, he was first dean of engineering, as you know, right? So uh, this must have been like six or seven years ago. I can't remember exactly when now, but I sent him an email. I said, hey, I, can we meet? He had just become, so he said, yeah, let's meet. So, so I came over here. It was up there. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I thought that he was going to ask me uh, uh, questions about like what I teach and uh, you know my my research and he didn't or or grants and he didn't ask about any of that. He said, "Hey, he had done some homework. He's that uh, I heard that you have a startup company. Tell me about that." That was his first question. Right? So, so I started talking about it and he and at that time I was carrying around a z uh, thumb drive uh, that had uh, some company slides and, and he asked me. He said, "Do you have a pitch deck with you?" Uh, and I said, "Yeah, I do. Well, let's fire it up." That's, that's my first meeting with the dean of engineering, right? You, you would expect that they would ask you some more uh, garden variety academic questions, right? What classes do you teach? How many students you have? And things like that. It wasn't any of that. It was just directly about the, the company. And he, 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 he w went through my slides. He gave all kinds of advice. And he even like uh, picked up his phone. And he, he's a very connected person, right? He connected me to a VC. He said, hey, there's this person over here. You know, so. So, 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 so you get the idea, right? And uh, and uh, he's the president now, uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, uh, that it starts all the way from from the president's office, right? So we have a president who really wants every single one of you to become an entrepreneur. And uh, our new dean right now, Arvind Raman, I know him personally very well, and uh, he and I meet uh, quite often. And uh, this is exclusively what we talk about, right? Uh, uh, how many, how many student uh, companies do we have, student-born companies? How many faculty-born companies? Can, how can we, how can we uh, enhance this? Uh, and uh, this, um, uh, I mean, every, so every university uh, has some sort of an entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? Uh, every university, uh, uh, you can see on their websites that they'll, you know, brag about, you know, we're entrepreneurial, or, you know, ecosystem and that sort of thing. But here, it's really true. So in 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 many other places, uh, I mean, as far as I can see, um, even though uh, every university really wants to, you know, brag about being an entrepreneurial ecosystem. When you, and I'm saying this as a professor, right? When you, when you go a little bit further down um, uh, into the trenches and start talking to other you know, academics, uh, you will start feeling that uh, it's actually viewed as less than academic to be an entrepreneur okay, in other universes. Not here, okay? It is very, very important here. It's, it's a part of uh, the new academic culture that we really want to create. And I can say this to you as a, as a, as a, uh, as a faculty member, uh, as someone that talks to the dean and, and the president and, uh, and uh, other people in, the, in, in that office all the time. So it is very important to us that, that you start companies and, that, and, and you make those companies successful. Okay? And, uh, and I want to echo something that uh, Professor Kinzerism said. Uh, we as professors, we don't train you for everything. We can't. I mean, you're only here for a you know, limited amount of time. Uh, you know, I'm an ME professor. You know, if we teach you how to uh, uh, free body diagrams, balance the forces, set them equal to you know zero, uh, or you know if it's moving, then you know. Anyway, so uh, you get, but we don't we don't really train you on uh, how to handle a situation when uh, your uh, the bank where your uh, 
startups money uh, is 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 uh, is residing is about to collapse, right? It's just it's actually happened to me. You must have heard of a Silicon Valley bank collapse, right? When that happened, I was on an airplane, and uh, you know I was a friend of mine who was a Wall Street banker texted me. I was on an airplane on Southwest. You can actually text; it's free texting. But uh, he said, "Man, they're taking your bank into receivership. It's it's bankrupt, right?" And, I'm like, open the door. I want to jump out of the airplane, right? So uh, it's investor's money, right? It's very stressful, right? It's like, what are you going to, it's not really my fault what happened, but uh, uh, ultimately it is your fault if you're really running the company, right? So, so you start thinking about all of these things, but the, the, you, you don't get, the, the, this may be an extreme example. And in the end, nothing happened. As you know, it's the, the government stepped in and all that. But uh, th there are all kinds of uh, stressful situations that, you never plan for uh, when you're running a company. It, they just like pop up, okay, out of out of out of somewhere. And 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 for many of them, you're not really trained for. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the 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 most important thing, it, like in my humble opinion, in my experience, is uh, to really stick to that idea as though it's your child, right? There's no abandoning it. Like you have to. There's no abandoning it, right? Unless uh, uh, you know, unless. Uh, you know, things are really, really, really bad in a totally unmanageable situation. There's no abandoning it, right? So, um, and, uh, and, 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 and I can't really say enough about how important it is um, to uh, take action as opposed to just sitting and continuously thinking and building a list of what things could go wrong, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this can go wrong. There's a pretty good chance that many of them are not going to go wrong, and there's a pretty good chance that there are many other things that you didn't even think about that will go wrong, right? So uh, the, 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 the most important thing is to, to really uh, keep thinking very positively about that very end goal, like you really keep imagining your company very successful, either it's acquired or making uh, products and people are buying the products, you're making an impact on, uh, on people's lives. Uh, from our perspective as faculty, we love seeing the, our inventions coming out of our lab so they don't just benefit our own students. They don't only produce papers, uh, uh, but uh, they get in the hands of other people and, uh, and, and make an uh, impact on people's lives, right? So we really would love to achieve that here at Purdue, and uh, you are the ones that will make it happen. Uh, you know, we, uh, and we're here to help. So I think from please. the, you know, to put, to put a bow on it from the student's perspective, right? Like it's, tot I think to emphasize, um, it's totally okay to fail, right? Like uh, this is probably the first company that uh, you know we've gone this far, but uh, there are two or three other companies or um, you know things that we tried that you'll never heard of that we've done. So we failed like many times in undergrad on you know trying to commercialize things, trying to work on things, and so it's just about getting your reps in. And I think Professor Tamara also emphasized that right, like just go for every opportunity that's available. It really doesn't hurt to try. I, I don't really see, like there's not the barrier. I mean, the opportunity cost at, at the earliest stage of it is like extremely low. Yeah, and just to echo that as well, you know, as students, typically younger, not as established, not you know, don't have a mortgage, don't have you know all these other things, right? It, it's it's the the risk of failing is isn't as severe, and so go ahead and take that risk. It's it's you know, you, one thing that you know when I was thinking about, okay, should I do this startup? Should I go in industry? was, okay, what, what's the worst that's gonna happen? I'm going to, let's say the startup fails, I'm going to gain so much knowledge of, that will help me not only just differentiate me from my peers, but just grow professionally and personally. And so like, the worst thing that's gonna happen is, I'm gonna learn a lot, right? So, so I think kind of going into that mentality and continuing to just persevere, right? As, as um, Professor Saverin had mentioned, right? It's like, you know, just being able to push through those days and, and just persevere when the when the going gets tough and, and having that mindset. I mean, um, just want to also thank Professor Saverin. He's been a great mentor for us uh, as, as well. And so just having mentors and people that can surround you, that can help you and build you up is, is another good, um, just important thing to keep in mind as you start the company. Yeah, totally. I think Jay mentioned something there uh, that I wanted to echo. It's like at our stage, right, at our age, uh, even the worst experiences in a startup are amazing lessons learned, right? And I think somebody asked me, you know, maybe it was our uh, professor, chief scientist, a couple months ago, there was a tipping point where everything could have fallen apart. And he's like, Nick, like, the company could die next week. Like, wh what are you gonna do? And, and honestly, I looked at him and I said, look, I'm like 24. 
if this all fails, <laughs> I'll uh, continue doing my PhD with you slowly, nicely, and then go work at uh, a big company and, and try again later. So it's, I mean, it really, you could, you could start an entity today for online, very cheap, and it, the opportunity cost is so low. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'll just I'll just pitch in on you know we don't we don't teach uh, a lot of the skill sets that you need to be an entrepreneur you know and a lot of that motivation is that internal motivation but hopefully what we have taught you uh, and something that we pride ourselves on is is teaching our students to be problem solvers um, to take initiative um, and I think those if if there's anything that you can that take away is is learn how to you know be good problem solvers, take initiative, um, drive it forward. That's one thing that I would take away uh, from a, an engineering education. Thank you very much. And uh, Bruce, do you have anything to add from an investor uh, perspective? No, I guess I yeah. I, all I can say is I think you've all said the right things. I, I, I love the mentality of, yeah, I mean, the stakes, I mean, it'd be better to go do this for a couple of years and fail now than to wait way down the path in your career. The opportunity cost is going to be much higher. Um, and, and by the way, for any of you, I mean, for the ones of you who think you know what to go do now, great. I mean, I think you've already gotten a lot of advice. If you don't know what to do, I, I have a couple of thoughts that I, I would share is number one, consider joining one of these companies. Like that might even, I, we've had it, we've seen this happen literally like volunteer because they have no money really typically. So, I mean, at the very early I think age, Jay does. So, what's that? <laughs> I think Jay does. Yeah. <laughs> Not that much. Well, well, see, you guys are way down the path now. I think of you as mature and in, in entrepreneurs. No, but seriously, like w we've just seen this recently that there were three, I'm not going to name them by names, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but three engineers were working on a startup and they needed like business help to think about, uh, you know, sizing the market and such. And we, through hook or by crook, we happened to find out about a student at the Daniels, whatever it's called now, Mitch Daniels School of Business that wanted to do that kind of thing. He volunteered to spend the whatever, I don't know what it's going to be, you know, six months with them in his spare time doing that. He's going to be a winner. He's going to get this great thing on his resume. And they, hopefully that's going to win for them. But, but also it could be literally join. Or if, the other thing is if you don't know what to, if you, have a, if you have this dream but you're not sure where to start, just do something. I mean, literally, just build, think of it more like a hackathon. Like, you know, the fame, one of the slightly famous recent, recent years startups out of Purdue was Socio, this meetings planning software that became later bought by Cisco, became part of WebEx. Those guys met each other at a hackathon. They envisioned this on a lark in a hackathon. So just get together, at, get together with friends and build something. And it's and it's related to what both Nick and Jay said. So you build something and it doesn't go anywhere. You've learned a lot about how to build stuff, how to collaborate as a team and try to solve some problem. So just do something. <laughs> Completely agree. Completely agree. Anything you'd like to uh, add, Professor Kinsner? Should we? Should we? Uh, are, yeah. Any questions? Yes, sir. Please. I think uh, uh, different people may have a different uh, uh, answer uh, to that. But uh, so uh, we're obviously not going to uh, argue that we are Silicon Valley, right? Uh, so it, it's uh, or 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 Boston for that matter, right? So uh, having said that, uh, the world has become smaller, especially after COVID, right? I mean, this gentleman lives in Silicon Valley; he's here right now, right? So. Uh, besides, we don't even need him to be physically here to, to anymore to, 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 to be connected to him. And uh, uh, for example, uh, my own startup company is in the Boston area, right? Uh, it's everything is just as if I am there, really. Like we're, we're communicating through Slack and everything. So uh, now, now uh, as far as resources are concerned, Purdue has a lot of resources, okay? So um, 
uh, we as a John Martin Entrepreneurial Center, obviously we are only focusing on engineering, right? Because we're an engineering center, right? So if you're not in engineering, have nothing to do with engineering, then uh, you know we we work with our with our own students, which is you know already a pretty big population, right? So, but uh, we have other uh, opportunities and resources uh, at, at at Purdue uh, in PRF, for example, we have the incubator, okay, and that's uh, uh, they cast a very wide net, right? They have uh, uh, they have programs, um, and. Um, uh, we have the foundry again at Purdue that actually does investments, that invests in, uh, even as the John Martin Entrepreneurial Center, we invest in companies through the foundry, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, we also have uh, a lot of uh, uh, founders that have already started companies. Uh, if they have started a company in, in, in your field of interest, uh, then I'm pretty sure, especially if, they're, if they've been successful in that, I'm sure that they can offer very good advice. And uh, uh, echoing uh, some of the things that Bruce himself said, network is very, very important. It's all about the people that you meet. It's actually, and I'm going to say this to you as someone that develops and teaches technology, it's actually more important than the technology because the technology, uh, you already know how to fix those problems. You're trained to do it, right? It's something, or, or even if you can't fix it, you will know who can fix it, right? So I mean, technology is actually not that, that, that much of a problem. Uh, but uh, 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 when you're working on an, on an idea, you're sort of like a inching and inching and inching. Like there's this linear, linear, linear increase. And sometimes you're thinking, well, this is just not going fast enough. And all of a sudden, you meet someone, one pivotal person. And then, boom, you tunnel to a different level, OK? Yeah. And uh, that, very nonlinear, okay? And then there may again be another period where things are going linearly, linearly, or maybe sometimes, uh, you know, flat. Sometimes they may even go down, actually. There are going to be times when you will feel like, oh, my God, are we failing, right? And then, and then, and then you'll go back up again. Uh, but um, uh, the, 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 the most important uh, resource we have, uh, in my opinion, is that we have a huge alumni network, okay? Purdue has so many people. Uh, that are uh, successful businessmen, successful entrepreneurs, okay? Um, and uh, uh, far more important than the classes that we teach here regarding entrepreneurship or the certificate programs that we have, which are, you know, I encourage every single one of you to, to, to go through them, is to uh, enhance your network and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and meet uh, those um, individuals that can be... Uh, uh, that can make all the difference in the world, okay? Uh, in terms of... Uh, Helping you get funding, or giving you, uh, or connecting connecting you to another potential buyer or potential uh, potential partner, um, uh, and uh, the, the 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 key is that you continue persevering. Like uh, it is, you continue clawing with your fingernails. Like the moment uh, if you you don't really uh, get the help that you want, that you continue and you talk to somebody else. That person doesn't help you. Talk to somebody else. And, uh, in the back of your mind, it really has to be that this is really going to succeed. I'm really going to make this happen. Um, uh, you send an email to someone. If they don't respond, send them another email. If they don't respond, send them another email. Then send somebody else an email. So that really is, has got to be the mentality. If you, once you get into that mentality, then uh, even if you're in a resource-scarce environment, which you are not, Purdue has tons of resources, uh, you uh, are going to make things happen for yourself, really. I'd say there's actually quite a few resources, not just Trask, for AI ML. So the president has, I think, um, AI is one of the core first tier focus areas for the school. Um, there's a ton of opportunities. There's the JMEC fund. There are two separate PRF funds under the Innovates brand. Uh, if you're early stage, I would start at Incubates, which is run by Justin Renfro. There's i that uh, Professor Tamara has highlighted. So there's, there's a ton of capital to work with um, early stage. Some of it's just coming online. There's an angel network that's coming on um, with like a lot of Purdue alums and VCs. Um, at, you know, a ton of the VCs are Purdue folks, like our lead investor is a Purdue guy. So um, I'd push back and say that there are a ton of resources out there for AI ML startups at Purdue. Also, I have to say this gentleman was at a talk I gave yesterday, so I give him extra points that he listened to me twice. <laughs> Good. Cut him a check. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So, uh, at Purdue, we have the technical training to solve essentially any problem. Can you start from scratch, please? Of course. So, at Purdue, we are trained to 
solve pretty much any problem, whether we do it ourselves or we know who to ask to solve the problem. My question is, how do we find the problem to solve? Because a lot of small businesses fail because there's no market need for what they develop. So <clears throat> I think that's, you know, you'll learn that through some of these Purdue, you know, resources, i Fire Firestarter, Purdue Foundry, or things like that. But it's, you might have an idea to solve this quote unquote problem, but you need to test your idea out in the market so going out and doing customer discovery. So, you know, for us, we thought that our wearable should look like this. And then we realized that, okay, let's go talk to customers, see what they would think about how this device looks and feels. And we ended up actually pivoting and shifting the design of our product because of that. So I know that doesn't exactly kind of, that example isn't exactly to what you're talking about the problem, but having that mindset of being willingness to change and adapt and pivot based on what the market is telling you. So you may have, you may see a problem, you may think about that, oh, this problem exists, you may even hear from somebody else about this problem. As you start thinking about the solution to that problem, being open and willing to change as you test your solution with potential customers. Yeah, it's, it's a great answer. So yeah, honestly, the answer is just sort of start anywhere, right? Like if you look at major companies that have been successful, Slack is a good example, or Brex. Brex is that corporate finance uh, for, for startups company. I think they started as like a VR tech company, right? And they just realized that this would not work. And they pivoted halfway through their uh, Y Combinator experience into a, a corporate card startup. So the, I think the easiest answer is just to try something and be open to changing it when you realize it's not quite right. right. Or, uh, to your point, uh, it's like s s Slack, you know, the company Slack, they started as a game company and the, and they in their spare time they happened to build a communication tool to help themselves communicate better. But, you know, I'll give a, maybe it's a controversial answer to your question is, I believe if you're gonna start a company, and I, I mean, not just experiment, you know, it's great if you wanna do experiments, get a team together, see if you like working together. Those are all great. But unless you believe in what you're doing, don't go too far. Be, I would argue, go get, a, go get a job at what I would call a best known methods company. Pick a company that you think is really well managed, also preferably a company that's growing quickly so you see what it, because you have to understand how to deal with rapid change, because that's what startups are all about. And you'll learn so much the great thing about the real world of corporations is don't tell anybody I told you this, but corporations are full of problems. I, you don't, I mean, even the best run companies, it's gonna be full of problems. And then you'll, it'll help you think about recognizing problems. I, I feel like maybe Nick, you said this, you, you worked for these big companies and you saw their problems and you decided to solve their problems. So I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'll take it. <laughs> Yeah, so just like asking the right questions, just, you know, looking at things that you know, right? Like where I'm an airplane guy, so <laughs> the only problems that I could find were in that space. Jay's in uh, the BME space, and you, we don't stray too far from what you know, is, is what I'm starting to realize. The, the Brex guys had done finance before they tried doing this VR thing, and then reverted to a finance thing, so. Even if you, from my perspective, even if you think that you found the right problem to solve, you, that's probably going to change. Uh, probably, uh, it's not not definitely, but probably you're going to find out because things change. A uh, couple, maybe a couple years later or a year later, uh, a very big company might come to you and say, "Look, we love your technology, but we would love it if you actually worked on this problem and then not 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 that problem." And then you start hearing that from a couple other companies, right? Then you want to be, you know, responding to that, right? You can't just be stubborn on, uh, you know, it, it, in, insisting on something that uh, is not really uh, uh, being received by, uh, by, uh, by, by a potential acquirer or potential customer, right? So um, uh, I would uh, say something along the lines of what, uh, what, 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 what Nick said. Um, well, first of all, Bruce is absolutely right. You have to really, really believe, religiously believe in your idea, otherwise, it's just not going to go anywhere because it's not easy to get. You, you, you hear all these news of this company acquired this company for this many uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And then you only hear that, that story. And it sounds like, oh, they just met and they shook hands and they wrote the check. And it's not like that. Okay. It just takes a very, it's a, it's a long process. Okay. Uh, so uh, 
So you really have to believe that to, to, to go through those tough times, you really have to believe in, in, in your idea. But once you have that belief, right, go ahead and start somewhere. You really have to take that action. You know, start the company, start working on it, uh, invest your own uh, energy into it. And then uh, if things change, things will change. You have to adapt to it. Okay, that's basically what I would say from my perspective. One thing they teach you in the NSFI core, and I'll just be really quick here, um, is is to do this customer discovery that we've been talking about, um, but not just you know putting your hypothesis out in front of people and asking what they think about it, um, you know asking them what their pain points are, and then going another few steps forward, you know why, so always ask why. Why is that their pain point? Why is you know, and just keep drilling down. Uh, you do that, you know, 10, 20 times across uh, different people in the industry, and you'll see, you'll, it's amazing. I mean, I saw it firsthand. You start to see these commonalities kind of point out. So that's kind of just a practical answer. Um, but, you know, talking, using your network, leveraging those contacts into others, and, and being able to pivot, um, but within, you know, within where your passions lie. So that's kind of my summary. I think we had one more question. Um, so I'm this not not so much of a technical question, but um, every so single company that has succeeded, most of them have had a co-founder or two. Can you can, um, can you speak up a little bit, please? Yeah. Or just bring it. Is closer. the microphone working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, every single successful company, most of them have a co-founder. Um, how do you guys pick your co-founders, and how do you guys evaluate that this is the person that I want to go into business with, and this is not the guy that's going to screw me over when we want to get bought out or something like that? Because on as a as someone who's also managed a, uh, a team here, um, I got screwed over, unfortunately. And so, like, so that has taught me is like, okay, I need to, it's very, like what you guys said earlier, it's very important to, like, one bad hire can ruin an entire team. One bad co founder can screw over your entire project or your, your company. So, how do you guys know this is the person and, and how do you guys evaluate that? Because that's not something that you can find on paper. You, you can do it on paper. So, uh, Oh, oh, so not, sorry, but you can protect yourself on paper, right? Like with cliffs, sorry. But um, I think uh, <laughs> I have an interesting perspective because I was also a co-founder and then we went through a co-founder separation. And quite frankly, it's very synonymous to a divorce, right? Like, especially if you're later stage, equity's already started vesting. Now lawyers get involved. Who takes custody of the children? It comes up. Yeah. But um, yeah, quite frankly, um, picking the right co-founder is extremely important. I would say... Um, it's like dating, to be honest. Like you, you kind of just have to feel each other out in terms of how you work. You know, do you respect each other? Is there a mutual level of um, do you work well together? Is the fundamental um, thing. And I mean, any of these folks were, will tell you the co-founder will be the last person standing on the team when everything else goes wrong, right? Like so, ultimately, you're looking for that quality, and you're looking for somebody who will be in the trenches with you. Um, but there are ways to to structure this on paper, right? Vesting with cliffs. You can, you know, have a co-founder separation and it works out and then find a new co-founder later on. You can always start something and then add a co-founder. Um, that's something that frequently happens. So the founder of Coinbase, who, fun fact, went to my high school, um, started with the idea and then found the co-founder like two or three stages later than you would expect. So you can develop the idea yourself and then tack someone on when you, when you find the right when you find the right person. The co-founder that we have today, I met in a, a lounge in San Francisco airport. We just happened to hit it off. So you never know. I met mine at Chick-fil-A. That's <laughs> tasty. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can just quickly add to that is, um, you know, my co-founder and I have had a great experience. You know, we started in our lab together. So even before we started the company, we had two years of, of us just getting to know each other building a both a professional in the lab and also a personal relationship and we actually became friends and then we started and went into the business. Um, yes, I, I agree with everything Nick said. You know, you can protect yourself on paper through legal documents and that would you have you should do that for sure. Finding somebody I think who has the same vision as you but also has a different set of strengths. So if you are the both the exact type of thing with the exact same strengths you know, what value is each other co-founder bringing? So finding somebody that can complement your strengths, even though I have another, I'm technical, my co-founder is technical as well. There's on how we execute and how we think, there's differences in, in, our, in our opinions and, and in our mindsets. And so, yeah, we're going to butt heads. And, but it's, it's, it's having a shared mindset and having a shared response, uh, 
responsibility and also shared respect for each other that, okay, it, you know, we're both trying to see this thing through and we're working together. Um, so, yeah. Also, I, mean, I would add to that uh, the, the personal aspect of this. Like, you, uh, you need to listen to your gut feeling. Like, if you don't like the person, okay, then it's probably not a good idea to be uh, partners with them or even recruit them as an employee into your company, okay? Uh, it's, uh, even if you think that they have really good uh, credentials, if your gut feeling is telling you, you know, I don't really think I can get along with this person, then you probably won't get along with that person. Eventually, something is going to happen. So you really should listen to that gut feeling. And, but beyond that, you can't really control what's going to happen in the future, right? You just need to act, right? Uh, so uh, there are certain things that you can do, like Nick mentioned some of it. You set cliffs, right? The cliff basically is that... So, th so they, they, they have to work for at least a year, for example. That year is the cliff. And uh, if they leave before the cliff is up, then they don't get any stock. Does that make sense? So you don't want to keep giving stock to people that are just going to you know, work a little bit and then leave, work a little bit. Then, then, then it basically makes your cap table very complicated. You don't want to have that many shareholders if, who uh, no longer have any stake in the company or who may have left the company without, uh, uh, you know, with on, 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 on bad feelings, for example, right? So, Does but, the Cliffs yeah. thing apply to, like, founding employees, too? Like, people you can hire later? Yeah, it's pretty standard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the most standard is uh, four-year vest, one-year Cliff. Yeah. yeah. Four-year vest, one-year Cliff, yeah. But, but, yeah, so that, but those are some... But even beyond that, right? You can't just control everything. That there, you can't just worry about is this going to happen. If you really like the person, and then and then and then you 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 set the cliff into place, and uh, your lawyer has seen it, and uh, you know you interviewed them, and you have some high expectations, things are going well, then you just got to go ahead with it. You can't continuously worry about what's going to happen three years down the line. Something's going to happen. It's going to happen anyway. So, yeah, I worked at a VC in Palo Alto this past year, and the biggest red flag that you'll see is when uh, half of the cap table is taken up by somebody who has nothing to do with the company anymore. That, that's pretty much like the biggest turnoff. You can get to a term sheet, and once like that might not pass diligence. So. Oh, sorry. What do you mean by like um, the the person is unrelated to the company? Yeah. So if you have a, a co-founder that you started with, right, and you split the company 50-50, and then you enter uh, some sort of funding round, you get a term sheet. They're going to go through diligence. One of the items on the legal side of diligence is typically um, reviewing the cap table. Um, and if 50% of the company is owned by a co-founder that you have now fired, so it's right, who, like who, who, who now hates you, right? right? Who's not willing to play? Who has voting rights? That you know might be a deal breaker. It usually is a deal breaker. So maybe you should explain what a cap table is. It's just the percentage breakdown of ownership, right? So how many hands are in the pie, effectively, yeah. yeah. Professor Kinzer Ersum, should we wear, your, wear our professor hats and ask our students to go back to their classes, or should we continue <laughs> this wonderful discussion? I think as much as, yeah, as, much as we would love uh, to keep talking, I think we are at time. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chari again, and Bruce, and Nick, and, and uh, J. Jay, <laughs> completely blanked. Sorry, I'm looking right at you, Jay. Um, and especially Bruce. Thank you for coming and sharing your wisdom um, with us. We really appreciate it. So, uh, My and pleasure. Thank all of you for kind of sticking it out with us in the end. We hope that you've heard a lot of things that, uh, that are, are motivating and interesting, and you can uh, go out and, and plot a path for yourself to entrepreneurship. So thanks again. Thank you.